One day in Hartford, Connecticut, two visitors, one traveling from Utah and the other from Belgium, would meet and become fast friends. The first was an inventor. The other was a businessman in desperate search of a product. From this chance encounter, the world would soon be introduced to the modern self-loading pistol. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the FN Model 1900 pistol. Let's take a look in the light box. This little guy is only six and three quarter inches long, has a weight of 1.4 pounds, and a magazine capacity of seven rounds. We're gonna get to those in just a second. Now there's two big names behind this pistol. Uh, we'll get to the inventor in just a moment. I'm sure most of you know him anyway. And we'll talk a little bit about that businessman. Now Hartberg had actually been born in Connecticut and he'd gone to work in Belgium for FN as the Director of External Affairs later on in life. Well, as the Director of External Affairs, he had a unique problem. We're going to cover more about FN's history when we get to the uh, Mauser Model 1889, but I should probably cover just a bit right now, which is that FN was formed by a sort of consortium of Liège gun makers, very famous names, all trying to sort of pool resources in the case of large military contracts. So let's say the government wants 50,000 of something, you know, rifle, pistol, whatever. These guys needed to have a facility that they could sort of pool in on and get that sort of work done and share in the profits because each individual company was just too small to keep expanding and contracting every time there was any of these offers on the table. So this ended up with the adoption of the Mauser 1889 forming into what was known as Fabrique Nationale. Got me so far? Good. All right, so Fabrique Nationale is now a large consortium. It has the involvement of many smaller names that, well, they're not small, they're quite big names, but now they're starting to be dwarfed by Fabrique Nationale itself. The Mauser 89 is doing well. They're getting a strong reputation around the world for quality, and there's a little pride lost. So names like Francot and Nagant sort of leave their stakes in the company to go back to their own work. At the same time, back in Germany, Mauser and its parent company, Ludwig Lowe, are a little irritated. You see, they've designed this 89 Mauser and they've licensed it to the Belgians, but FN's getting all the credit for how great it really is. They're not a big fan of this. So, when FN starts to kind of hit the skids and the original shareholders are getting upset and a little bit of money's being lost here and there, Ludwig Lowe starts to chase them around. And in the end, through some financial maneuvering we'll talk about later, Ludwig Lowe ends up with controlling interest of FN. With that, they sort of tame the company. They leave it just to produce for the Belgian government, which is a shame because it was a very, very, very modern facility, possibly one of the best in the world at that time. And yet the machines are really being wasted on smaller uh, contracts that are sort of rounding out these Belgian orders. And otherwise, they're sort of expecting it to falter. They don't, they don't want it there. It's competition for them. Well, there's still people working at FN that do want to keep working at FN. And Hartberg's one of them. So they start to kind of expand into the other products. And one of those is bicycles. So Hartberg goes over to America to look into some of the new innovations in bicycle manufacturing, and that's when he runs into our friend, John Moses Browning. Now, anybody who is watching who doesn't recognize this man's photo or name, welcome to the religion. I can't even begin to start a biography of Johnny B on this show because it will go for four hours, and that's really pressing it to get everything done. This man is a massive firearms inventor, and a big, big name in the industry. But let's focus in on what he was doing at that moment. He had been in Connecticut in order to sort of see what was going on with his machine gun production over at Colt. That's another story that we will cover. Uh, he brought along some pistol designs, and just for your background information, he had been working on pistols. As a matter of fact, Colt already had the patent for a uh, 38 caliber lock breech, sort of military cartridge pistol of his, but they passed on sort of a new design he had been working with since about 1896, 1897. This was a pocket model with a smaller 32 caliber cartridge. They didn't think that it had much military applications, so they walked. 
Well, he had the designs and he had an example prototype in his hand when he was in Connecticut. And it just so happens through whatever means, he was introduced to Hart Berg, who was supposed to be looking at bicycles. Instead, when he saw what essentially was this handgun, he was impressed. And we'll get into why in just a moment. So he takes the gun, uh, well, he asks for the gun, he doesn't just steal it, but, you know, he requests the gun and takes it back to Belgium, uh, along with the plans. They marvel at the fact that it's able to shoot 500 rounds uninterrupted with no problem, and so they begin production almost right away of this model 1899. They barely change anything from his original plans. Along with the 1899 came a new 32 caliber cartridge. We know Browning developed the 32 ACP cartridge for his pocket pistol, and it appears as early as 1897, but where it came from is a bit of debate. The most likely explanation, backed by the dimensions of the cartridge, is that it was derived from 32 Smith & Wesson Long. The cartridge was released publicly with the Belgian model 1899 as 7.65mm Browning. Later that same year, UMC would produce it as 32 Browning, even though there were no pistols in this chambering in the US. They were mostly sold to South and Central America until the pocket pistols made it back home where they had been invented. It would prove to be a very popular cartridge, considered a self-defense standard into the 1960s. Eventually, 380 and 9mm would prove to be more reliable man-stoppers, and so 32 faded from the common market of chamberings. The 1899 was offered for sale commercially, but also FN rushed to get it into military trials. The two big ones would be the Belgian pistol trials and the British pistol trials. In order to woo a military contract, FN would introduce both the regular 1899 that we'll see in a moment and a large model 1899 with an extended barrel slide and uh, magazine. This would be rather short-lived as no one took any real interest in it because it still chambered 32 ACP. Now, the British weren't all that interested, they really didn't like the chambering. But the Belgians, perhaps out of national pride, took it a little bit more seriously. They saw the utility in a small, compact pistol that was really, really reliable. It certainly beat their Nagant revolvers at the time. So they reviewed it pretty well and ended up adopting it, which is great for FN because now they can actually build these things. They did, however, want a couple of changes. The biggest one was the inclusion of a lanyard loop and spot facing on the safety markings and slight changes to sort of grip and grip panel. So this becomes the model 1900 as we see today. For a brief period both models were produced side by side with the 1899 being sold to civilians and the 1900 being sold to the military but by 1902 that was over with. It was kind of silly to have two nearly identical models in production. There are a few transitional 1899s that may have 1900 parts though. It's a whole other science. So with the retirement of the model 1899, we are left with what the world would know as Le Pistolet Browning. We have the history, but what exactly has been invented here? Let's take a closer look. First off, right off the bat, I gotta say, number one thing, this is a slide operated pistol. That's a very, very new concept at that time. As a matter of fact, this is the granddaddy of all modern handguns, because if you look, we have a slide and breech block. That's not a common feature. That is invented by John Moses Browning, and it would be refined over a century. We're still using the concept today. All right, other than that, we're looking at a single action striker fired pistol. Uh, the recoil spring is set above the barrel, which means that this position down here, the lower position is the barrel, gives it a low bore axis, actually helps with recoil. If we flip her around, we're going to see that we have the simple safety. Um, this is actually a German contract. So it doesn't have the spot facing where they've sort of, you know, slightly, slightly milled down where the safety markings are so they stand out. But that was included on the Belgian 1900s. Uh, grip should be the same. Everything else about this configuration is pretty much the same. Uh, just so you know, uh, I'll bring up a sight picture. But they're pretty small, pretty hard to read. And uh, importantly, uh, an internal lever that we'll get to in a moment will rise to block the sight picture if the gun is not cocked. All right, now for takedown, unfortunately, this gun doesn't have an easy way to do that. You see the breech block is locked in by two screws here, and we can go ahead and remove them and get a look, but it's not gonna be the easiest process in the world. I'm going to have to loosen them both up.
take them out and retain them somewhere without losing them. Now this is a tight fitting pistol, so I have the luxury of taking the magazine out afterwards. You may want to do it before, and you may want to keep some pressure on that slide, but luckily our donor here has an excellent piece. So let me go ahead and get that mag out just so you can see this is a complete pain in the butt. It's a push forward and pull out heel release. It is extremely tight. It is fingernail bending. All right, so from here, the slide actually can be let forward. It just takes a little bit of a jimmy on this one because she's so tight. I'll give her a couple pushes. And she is away. All right, so we'll set her aside. Now we have one of the most beautifully complicated looking setups you can imagine. We'll get into that more in the animation, but let me go ahead and show you that breech block separately real quick. I'll release that recoil spring, which is also serving to work the firing pin. You'll see that in a second. And pull out that breech block. Ta -da -da -da. Pretty straightforward. Not the worst thing to get into in the world, but certainly not easy, especially because when I go to set this back, I am going to have to pull that string tight. And there isn't really a keeper for it or anything like that. Uh, so, without too much of a fluff, why don't we go straight over that animation and get a real look at this thing in actual action. The FN-1900 is a single-action striker-fired pistol of extreme simplicity for its era. Looking at it now, there's a little extra going on. The action uses a single coil spring. Now, of course, there's another in the magazine, but just a single coil spring throughout the entire action. That's pretty impressive. There is no dedicated disconnector because it's a function of the trigger bar. You see its rounded top at the rear gets pushed down by the breech block during recoil, which causes it to slip off the sear. A set of three flat springs in the grip area of the pistol actually power the trigger bar, the sear, and hold that safety in place when it's in one of two positions. Note that there is not a dedicated firing pin spring. Instead, the recoil spring has an extension linked to a cocking lever. That cocking lever pulls the firing pin forward. That means both the firing pin and the slide operate off the same spring. All that in mind, the rest is pretty simple. We'll let this thing run its course. and hand it over to May. All right, let me load this thing. Rack the slide. Take aim, man. The safety is very simple to use. Let's take a quick look. Not bad, eh? All right, here's Othias. I'm glad we have May to stand in front of the camera instead of me at the range. Half the time I get sweaty. All right, so we are looking at the 1900 as a military pistol for a moment. So we need to talk about what happened to those Belgian contracts. They ordered pretty much the exact pistol you're seeing here, obviously with French instead of German on it. This is sort of actually an unusual piece. But uh, they had plain grips with no FN logo. These would turn out to be fairly fragile and chipped off, and you can actually find a lot of them that have been reset with uh, Arsenal-made wood grips. It's not uncommon to find. And now, over the years, the more and more of the Belgian military would have their Nagants replaced with these 1900s. So you start to see it creep into the artillerymen, the cavalrymen, things like that. Until, finally, by 1912, even the National Guard has been re-equipped. And so, by the time we get to World War I, this is the official sidearm of the Belgian military throughout the entire First World War. This is the ubiquitous pistol of the Belgians in that conflict.
Belgium wouldn't be the only adopter of this pistol in a military or police role. We're going to see it exported to a lot of places. Austria, Hungary, the German police, Finland, Norway. It gets around. But these are in small sort of specific numbers and they're... It's a lot to cover. That's a whole other reading project. I, I'd recommend picking up a book for that. But uh, I actually, despite the nature of our show, want to get away from the military implications of this pistol for just a little bit. You see, the Model 1900 is hugely important to firearms history because it births the consumer pistol market realistically. I mean, yes, before this, commercial pistols were sold to people, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't a fervor. It wasn't a big, growing, exploding market until this little guy came out. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it was reliable, concealable, affordable. You could take it into polite society and be personally armed. And the other thing is we're sitting at the end of the Industrial Revolution. The middle class has emerged. Uh, a man can feel tied to a sense of modernity and technology. Um, he has a personal identity that also fits over top of his cultural identity. It's a time of pride and of personal interest. And consumerism is born in this period. And so, one of the big first consumer markets is pocket pistols. It's the armament of self in a polite and gentlemanly way. And so, these things spread like wildfire across the world. Now, a lot of you guys are international viewers, but here in the U.S., the idea of personal carry is still alive. So, it all descends from this little gun. Now, we know from watching our series and from the episodes that are going to come out after this one even, there are a lot of 32 ACPs that appear because it is such an explosive market. I mean, there's room to expand and sell for decades in a myriad of designs. Everybody emulates this little gun. It starts it all. I mean, when you look at every other little 32 that we're going to show for this war, and even after, it's this guy. It all comes from him. I mean, this is the birth of an entire family of pistols and an entire market of gun buyers. All right, now we should probably talk about how this thing became the Model 1900, because again, it was Le Pistolet Browning, and I'm sorry about my pronunciation there. When the 1910 comes out, that's the difference. As early as 1902, in some features, you would see this called the Model 1900, especially to distinguish it from the 1899. But publicly, it really wasn't known as that until they came out with the quote-unquote new model, the 1910. This one then became the old model, or the Model 1900. All right, with over 700,000 of these made, it was an extreme success for FN, and it set them up for many years to come as a reputable name in pistol manufacture. I mean, we still... They're, they're popular today with handguns. And it all comes from this little guy and just escaping by the skin of its teeth from under Ludwig Lowe's crushing grip of you must produce only for the Belgians. Even Lowe couldn't argue with this thing, and it was original to FN when they made their deal. All right, that's enough praise for this little pistol from me. Let's see what May thought of it. All right, once again, we've made room for May after a brief station break. Uh, she's got all the opinions on this sucker, so let's find out just what she feels about Johnny B's 1900. Would you start us on ergonomics? Sure. Right off the bat, notice this is a pretty heavy 32, but it's really thin. It's still very comfortable. I'm able to get a full finger grip on it. Um, now, one thing, of course, easy to spot off right off the bat, didn't like heel release. I mean, even right here, when there's nothing loaded in it, it's difficult to pull out. It, it was definitely one of the hardest magazines we've had to handle to date. Um, the slide I found really easy to operate actually because of these serrated protrusions right here. Nice and easy. Um, as for the safety on this one, you can actually take your time with that. It just snaps right into place. It's so easy to one hand. It's, yeah, it's just nice, crisp and clean. I definitely enjoyed this pistol. Yeah, honestly, it's well thought out. Like, it, again, we, we talk about being the mold setter, but it's still got a lot of positive little features because it focuses on usability. And going down that line, why don't you tell us about actually shooting this thing? How, how did it do? You know, I actually found shooting this to be very pleasant. The recoil, I thought, was really controlled. It's probably a combination between the weight and the low bore access. As for the trigger itself, it was a nice smooth pull all the way through, probably because of that stirrup trigger bar in there. It was a heavy pull through, don't get me wrong, but I felt it, the weight was equally distributed throughout the entire pull. Now, the only thing I didn't care for when shooting this was actually the sight picture. 
these are probably some of the smallest worst sites that I've shot to date. It actually made my, it made it very difficult for my grouping to be accurate, I thought. Uh, unfortunately, like we saw, the way that uh, mechanism is designed to block the sight picture, it feels like the sight picture was also kept very low so that the mechanism could block it. It ends up just being some of the worst sights we've seen. It's the one big failing on this pistol. I think it's just supposed to be a point shooter. All right, so I gotta ask you kind of a different question. How do you feel about this gun in terms of simplicity? Did it feel, did it feel normal to work with? And we've worked with some odd stuff. Yeah, I found it simple. What do you want from me? I mean, all I have to do is slap in the magazine at the bottom, I rack the slide, pull the trigger, and if I need to operate the safety, just one flick. It, this is simplicity for a gun. Yeah, we kind of take this for granted, but in the 1900, if I may, in the 1900, and I keep trying to drive this home, we have the birth of sort of the simple slide-operated handgun. Remember, as you watch these videos, we're going to have C96s and Lugers and Steyr Hans and all sorts of other exotic stuff. And each one's going to have at least one or more oddity in the way it operates. Like, it's just going to have this one little finicky thing or this, that, and the other. Well, when this gun came out, this was its one finicky thing. This was yet another very different pistol that was not the same as any of the others. But it worked, and it worked well, and it was very teachable and approachable. And so now, the idea of a magazine-fed, slide-operated, single-safety firearm, I mean, that lasted for a very long time. As a matter of fact, nowadays, we're even starting to get away from the safety. And that's the, the retaining even simpler form of this gun. So this is it. This is the definition of, you know, the common handgun. All right, so I'll give it back to you. Uh, final opinion, tacky opinion. Would you take it into battle? You know, I thought about it, and I'm going to have to start making the tough call. For this one, like 1914, I had better options. I wouldn't have taken it into battle. The seal release, the poor sights, I, I just, I would know there were better options for me at that time. But for 1900, hell yes, I would take this into battle. Everything's about context. It was very fast that people learned just what this thing meant in potential. And by the way, by 1910, Browning had worked out a much better design, and we're going to see that one in another episode. So it got left in the dust. It's just one of those things. When you set the mold, you start to look sort of generic and even overcomplicated by comparison. But as we keep sort of hammering home, this thing's revolutionary, this thing changes the game, and this is the root of so many other guns that we're going to talk about on this show. All right, do you have any final impressions or do you think it's time to wrap this one out? I think we got it. Okay, good. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, we've definitely had an increase in viewership lately and uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, announcements are after the credits. Thanks one last time. Thanks everyone. Hey everyone, sorry for the quality, but this is going to be a little quick and dirty. I'm in the middle of wrapping up the final render for the episode you just watched, in addition to answering a bunch of questions from The Great War, releasing our edited German Rifles episode, so if you haven't seen that, go check it out. Um, the other thing I need to cover is that we have an Indiegogo campaign for the posters going on. That has passed 5k now. We do get to keep roughly a third of that to actually put towards the trip. The rest is production cost fees for Indiegogo, that sort of thing. So that's huge. That's helping a lot. Um, we are getting close to that trip. Uh, I don't know if I covered this, but we will try to make the actual filming trip in January. So you probably won't see edited stuff for that until end of January, beginning of February. I'm sorry, we just like to do it right. Uh, let's see, the other thing. Oh, Patreon is up. Uh, I'm going to have to insert the dollar amount to my side after the fact because it's probably changing as we're talking. Now, uh, the other thing that I need to cover is that we have a sponsor of sorts. Uh, we had an offer for sponsorship from Handguns of the World, which is an excellent site, and uh, we actually kind of turned them down a, a little bit. In lieu of any sort of financial aid, we actually asked if, since they had such an extensive and very rare collection, 
would they be willing to donate pistols for us to be able to shoot? And they gave it some thought and they are willing. So uh, you're gonna see some more exotics, you're gonna see some more unusual designs, and a lot of that's gonna come from our new partners over at Handguns of the World. So certainly check them out and let them know that you appreciate us supporting them. And if you are a collector, do consider, you know, picking up something very unique for yourself over there. All right, well, that's it for now. Uh, thank you all again for watching. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the support. We have donor guns coming in. We have donor cash coming in. It's getting a pretty good head of momentum now. It's looking like the series is going to be self-sustaining.